Uh, so let me start by thanking all my students and collaborators and all the organizations that made this research possible. And you know, I, I went to the reception last night, and while I was there, I may have divulged some mildly embarrassing information to uh, some friends who showed that they were really great friends because they insisted I share this embarrassing information with all of you. So I thought I'd do that in the form of the classic game, uh, Two Truths and a Lie. And uh, so two of these facts are actual facts and one of them is a lie. Uh, and so, you know, let's just do a quick little straw poll here. How many people uh, think number one is a lie? You can raise your hands here. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, number two is a lie. Can you raise your hands from that one? And how about number three? Number three is a lie. Oh, wow, okay, all right, okay. So, uh, number one is actually a truth. Uh, I published zero papers in grad school, and I want to say that because I know there are a lot of students out there who get really worried if they don't publish a paper their first year or two, or uh, they worry about the number of papers they have when they're going on the job market and um, getting up in years. And so let me just say that no matter what your trajectory looks like, it can't be as bad as mine was. Uh, and it's okay, right? I, th I don't think we say that enough to our students. So you'll be okay. Uh, number two is also true. I haven't been to HCOMP. I follow the research from there uh, quite closely and I love the community and I'm super excited to be here. Number three is false. I have been to WISP before. Take that, all of you who raised your hands. Uh, no, just kidding. So uh, I have only been to WISP once before, and that was last year when WISP was in Tokyo. My students have been coming for a number of years. This is the first year I managed to go. And I was lucky enough to bring my family along, my wife and my five-year-old daughter, which was great. Uh, but also posed a problem, right? Because where are we going to stay? We're not going to stay at the conference hotel. Uh, what are they going to do while I'm going to the conference? And this is a pretty tricky problem. So I fired up the old Google and I said, where to stay in Tokyo, where I learned that basically it's complicated. Uh, so I scrolled down and opened a bunch of links and new tabs and I started to go through them. And as I started to do that, I encountered a lot of really useful information. So where are the best places to stay? Someone says Shinjuku, Ginza, so I'll look up where those are. Uh, someone says some more places. Whoa, I'm already overloaded. Okay, let me put a pin in those. Uh, oh, here's a forum post from someone who wants an area with a good vibe and lots of restaurants that's just like us, but we're probably not hitting the nightlife with a five-year-old. Uh, and so soon Shinjuku is starting to look pretty good until I read it's the most shady place in Japan. Uh, how about Ginza? Well, super ultra fancy boutique shopping is probably not our scene. Uh, we need to be near the Yamanote line? Okay, that's another constraint. And oh my god, okay, so maybe Shinjuku isn't actually very shady. Great, I have to put that back in the running. And as I search, I start to learn all sorts of things that build out my mental model. Like breakfast sushi at the fish market is amazing. It's rude to eat while walking. Real kimonos are insanely expensive. Bullet trains only stop for a minute at the station, so you better be there. Each region of Japan has a different specialty. There's lots more kinds of ramen than I thought there were. Department store basements have some of the best food. Shinjuku to Whist, door to door is 23 minutes and you have to turn right out the door instead of left. And when you get lost from turning left, you better have a cellular plan and there are three top MIFI providers in Japan who will rent them to you. But if you don't drop them off before you go through security on your way home, you have to mail it back after, okay? And at the end of this, I have this beautiful, rich mental model of how everything works and how everything fits together. And then, it's gone. No one else benefits from this. I myself have probably forgotten 90% of what I learned. And this isn't just about trip planning. What if you were a patient diagnosed with lung cancer and wondering about your treatment options? What if you were a graduate student trying to bridge the literature on user interfaces and human computation? 
or you're a programmer trying to learn which of these JavaScript frameworks out there they should I use and how do they all fit together, or a lawyer trying to figure out legal precedent about patenting a new software interface technique. And every day there's more and more information. And if you look at our brains, our ability to turn that information into useful knowledge has not significantly changed since at least the time we diverged from Neanderthal. <laughs> and the tools we're building aren't helping very much either. Search engines like Google and Bing, they're really good at finding simple answers to concrete questions like what's the weather today or how many baseball teams are there and billions of dollars are being spent on things like chatbots and personal assistants to make this even easier but the really hard work starts after search right how do we put all of this stuff together into mental models in our minds and now that we have all these devices and interfaces it's instead of making it easier, it's actually getting worse. Screens are getting smaller. We're doing this on the go. We're doing this in all sorts of different contexts. So if anything, it's getting harder to turn information into useful knowledge. So in a nutshell, the problem is that we now have to make sense of increasing amounts of information, but our ability to make sense of that is not keeping up. Now, what if you didn't have to start from scratch? What if you could start with this? And you could build on it, and you could go further and deeper and faster than anyone who came before you, and everyone coming after you could go further and deeper and faster and faster and faster. What if we could create an exponential of our own, a virtuous cycle in which people can build on the work of others, a universal knowledge accelerator, which can keep improving our ability to learn, make better decisions, and accelerate innovation. So how do we do it? Well, this is a really hard problem. There have been ideas for a long time. For example, one of the prominent ones is by Vannevar Bush. Many of you have heard of the Memex uh, in his famous essay in The Atlantic. Uh, and the idea here is that instead of just having a bunch of independent pieces of information, people could create associative trails that would link pieces of information together. And others could then start from those trails instead of starting from scratch. And while Bush's vision hasn't all come to pass, I think it at least gives us a good way to think about what the challenges are in building a universal knowledge accelerator. So the first is motivation. Bush envisioned there would be a new profession of trailblazers, those who find delight in the task of establishing useful trails through the enormous mass of the common record. But why would people do this, right? How, how many people would do this? What would make people spend this effort to generate trails? The second one is content. Bush envisioned his approach would work on almost any kind of content whether it's for lawyers, for patent attorneys, for historians. But what would that actually look like, right? Do all types of content have the same structures? Are trails actually the structure we want to use for all these different types of content? And the third and maybe hardest problem is aggregation. So Bush imagined the inheritance from the master becomes not only his additions to the world's record, but for his disciples, the entire scaffolding by which they were erected. Now this sounds great, but once you start to scale this up, aggregation becomes a real problem. What if there are millions of trails, and you, how do you find the ones you want? How do you choose between them or decide if this will leave this one versus that one? And should we be aggregating at a deeper level than just finding pieces of information? You know, if there's 10,000 reviews that all seem to say the same thing, do you really want a trail to each one of them? So the aggregation function of how you synthesize information across multiple sources is critical. So I'm going to discuss these three challenges <clears throat> and the approaches we've explored for addressing them in order to build a universal knowledge accelerator. And we haven't gotten there, but I'll tell you, catch you up on where we are so far. So the first approach we looked at was peer production. And peer production refers to communities of volunteers who self-assemble to build complex artifacts. So this has led to some amazing things. 
right? So Linux, Apache, the software that runs the internet, Stack Overflow, where programmers help each other on nearly any programming question you might imagine. The polymath projects, which have mathematicians ranging from Fields Medal winners to high school math teachers who are coming together and building on each other's work to prove unsolved math theorems. And for the purpose of this talk, we're going to particularly be interested in Wikipedia as the closest example to a large-scale knowledge accelerator that we have. In Wikipedia, millions of people build on others' work as they synthesize hundreds of millions of sources. And this has issues of its own, which I'll talk more about, but if we want to figure out how to build a universal knowledge accelerator, it's a pretty good place to start looking. So there are a lot of theories about how peer production works. A common one is known as Linus's law, coming from the Linux operating system. And the idea here, as Eric Raymond put it, is with many eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. Right? And the idea here is basically, add more people, get better stuff. But there's a problem with applying that to something like Wikipedia, where people are working interdependently, and they need to coordinate and resolve conflicts about what should go where, how should it be written. And in these coordination-intensive tasks, as the number of contributors increases, they incur process losses. So the group doesn't function as effectively as it could. And in the extreme, adding more people can actually have negative consequences. As Brooks's law states, adding manpower to a late software project makes it later. So we see this happening in Wikipedia, too. While most people only see the articles, it turns out that more than half of all the content in Wikipedia is actually below the surface. So this is work people are doing on talking to each other, resolving conflicts, or creating policies for other people to follow. And if you look closely at what kind of coordination they are actually doing, you see two major types. So one is communication, or people talking to each other directly. So here, someone named Jeff Matt is saying, for the Music of Italy article, I adjusted that section by shifting a few sentences. Tough Cat, I don't know how they choose their usernames, but Tough Cat says, Looks good, I'm fine with that, but I'm not sure I entirely agree with the placement. Okay, so one way they do it is talking to each other. But there's another kind of way they coordinate, which uh, we'll call concentration of work, in which a small group of leaders do the hard work of structuring the article. So here's an example for the same Music of Italy article. Uh, if you look at the history of it, Tough Cat actually started by setting the scope and structure of the article. And that scaffolding allowed a lot of peripheral contributors to come in and be effective in adding content. But at the end of this, the article had a lot of content, but now it was not very coherent. And so Jeff came in, and by concentrating the work and by having a big picture of what, every, what was happening, he's able to restructure the article to make it coherent. So if we want to test these theories at scale, we need some way to see how quality changes over time. And Wikipedia luckily provides this to us uh, with a mechanism called the quality assessment scale. So Wikipedians have made over a million assessments of articles, and those happen over time. And the top three of these are rigorously peer-reviewed. So we have some judgments over time of how these articles are changing. And what we can do is we can look and see what is it that causes them to change? Is it just adding more people to these articles, or does it matter about the way that these people coordinate with each other? And we can see whether the article at the end of some period improved in quality or not. And what we found, quite surprisingly to us initially, was that if you add more people to an article, all else being equal, there is no improvement in quality. And in fact, if you look at the trend line, it's negative, right? And so this fits with Brooks law that adding more people to a software project makes it later. But if those people coordinated well, then the effects reverse. So you saw that more adding more people does lead to more quality. And it really matters what kind of coordination you use. So if people are talking to each other, that works pretty well until you get to about 30 editors or so that 
turns out to be true in face-to-face -face groups as well. Uh, and in contrast, if you have leaders who are scaffolding the work for others, then we see that it becomes actually more effective the more people you have, so the higher quality your article will get. And so what this success suggests is that the success of Wikipedia is due to centralized leaders structuring the work of more decentralized, more peripheral crowds. And that seems to be true of many different kinds of peer production communities we've looked at, whether it's open source software where the leaders are maintaining this highly interdependent kernel that everything else depends on, or whether it's the polymath projects where leaders are keeping everyone informed about the big picture view and the different threads of investigation that are going on. So leadership and centralization seems to be really important. Unfortunately, it has some limitations. So for example, it can create bottlenecks when your leaders get busy, right? Or it gives a lot of weight to one point of view. Now, what if that point of view is biased, right? Or what if that point of view gets rid of all of the people they don't agree with? That's a problem. And it's also really sensitive to turnover. And that's not just an academic issue. The Wikipedia has recognized one of its most critical challenges being that its leaders are leaving faster than they're being replaced. So, on the one hand, we see that peer production is really powerful, especially for objective encyclopedic content where you have volunteers with strong intrinsic motivation and there are centralized leaders who can structure and coordinate things. But that's not enough for our purposes, right? So in terms of motivation, in Wikipedia there are a lot of areas like math or psychology where there's just as, not as much intrinsic interest as something that's more popular like Lady Gaga, right? Uh, in terms of content, a lot of the work that we do is not encyclopedic in nature. So planning a trip or researching health uh, information is subjective, and you need to stitch together a lot of different uh, articles, reviews, and advice in order to make sense of it, right? And centralization, as we just saw, has bottlenecks, biases, and turnover issues. So let's turn to an approach with complementary strengths, which is crowd work. And by crowd work, I mean any work that happens online and is completed by a distributed, dynamically sized workforce in exchange for pay. So this is important because a lot of the future of work, people think, is going to look a lot like crowd work. So uh, economists project about 20% of current American jobs could be sent down a wire, powering a workforce of 45 million full-time crowd workers. And this is already happening, so a well-known secret uh, is that major companies from Google to Microsoft uh, to Facebook have internal armies of crowd workers who are helping them with everything from curating search results to powering personal assistance. And we're starting to see crowds being used by companies like Siemens and Lowe's and Bosch and Nordstrom for creative uses as well to accelerate innovation beyond their own R&D teams. So kind of TLDR, if you're a major company and you're not using crowds today, you're probably at a competitive disadvantage. But what I'm going to be talking about is actually using crowdsourcing as a means of prototyping this idea of a universal accelerator, uh, knowledge accelerator. And for that, I'm going to talk about Mechanical Turk. So Mechanical Turk, as most of you probably know, uh, is a labor platform where people you know, take tasks from requesters and complete them for small amounts of money. Like uh, in this case, if you tell them what text is in an image, you may get a few pennies. And so this is not clearly an ideal platform for many, many reasons. But it's pretty good for our purposes because, first of all, we can motivate people with money to work on whatever we want them to work on. We can recruit a large number of people with relatively low latency. And it's good for stress testing our decentralized mechanisms because it's difficult to keep people around and get them to do what you want. So, the big problem here that we're going to be trying to solve, or if you'll forgive me, the elephant in the room when it comes to crowd work is context. If each person only sees a small part of the global view, they may not have enough context to be effective or to know how to contribute. So to make this more concrete, let's do a thought experiment, right? Imagine we had to all write an article together, and each person had to contribute only one minute of work. Okay, so let's say we're going to write an article about New York City. Uh, ready, 
go. So like, what, what, do, what do I work on? What are you gonna work on? What, what should we even do, right? Like all these thoughts may be going through your head and it's very difficult to coordinate them without some kind of central coordinator. So to start to attack this problem, we, we, our, our first attempt uh, was to take ideas from distributed computing. So for example, uh, the MapReduce paradigm. And so here MapReduce is a software approach for cutting problems into smaller problems, mapping those onto different processors, and then reducing all those intermediate answers to a single answer. And so we tried to apply this to writing articles, uh, and here's the intuition. So we would have a partition phase where a group of crowd workers, we would just ask them, well, what should the sections be for this article? You don't even have to write them or anything, just tell us what the sections would be, okay? They might say attractions and brief history and economy. And then we go to another group and say, can you find a single piece of information relevant to this section? And you don't, again, you don't have to write the article, it shouldn't take you very long, and they will come up with a, a lot of different uh, facts about each section. And then finally, in the reduce step, we go to another group and we say, look, can you, we already have all the information, can you just take it, massage it, put it into a paragraph? Okay, so no one person has a global view of what's happening, but still we're putting together all of this information into uh, what is hopefully a coherent article. And so when we compared this to Wikipedia, we found that our articles were rated just as high as Wikipedia articles and rated higher than if we had paid, if we took all the money we paid everyone, gave it to an individual, they didn't have to deal with all of this coordination cost business, uh, and so we still got articles that were rated better than that. And so that seemed promising. But there's a critical problem that kills this approach for most real world problems. And that is, what if you don't already know the structure, right? So in this case, we had to come up with the structure ahead of time. The first people had to come up with it. But what if you're writing an article about what a 28-year-old should do about arthritis in their knee? Or what do you do in LA with two kids? Or how do you get your tomato plants to grow better tomatoes? Like, do you know the answers to those things right now? Like, probably not. Right? And what do you do? You go and you look at the data and you learn the structure from the data. And so that is a much, much harder problem to decentralize. So to look at this, we first turn to clustering. So, uh, you know, this is a natural, obvious approach that has a lot of recent interesting work done on it from a computational perspective. Um, unfortunately, a lot of this requires huge data sets and still has problems with semantic uh, understanding, right? So you need to understand why two things are similar if you want to decide if they should go together or, set, or in different clusters. So in response, a lot of uh, people here have actually addressed this with some great work around crowd clustering. So can you use the semantic judgments that people can naturally make to leverage um, clustering for these smaller, richer data sets? And there's a ton of excellent work here. The common idea is usually that you give each crowd worker a subset of the data and they label or cluster it and then you aggregate that over people. But this has problems too. So first of all, it can get expensive, right? So you have to label, uh, you have to have workers label each piece of data. And second, each worker is only seeing a small piece of the data. So we have the same problem again, right? We have this context problem. And so just to make it explicit, if a worker sees the right set of data in that set, they probably have a pretty good idea of what things look like. But what about this worker? So this worker looks at this and is going to say, oh yeah, this, uh, this data is about you know, red stuff, dark red stuff, and pink stuff. And those may not be the categories that you want. And in fact, we do see that uh, you know, in existing work, that is a, a challenge that we're building on here. So here you can see that in addition to the green cluster, we also see greens and things like pastel, seafoam green, and other. So to uh, address this, we developed a clustering system called Alloy. Uh, that uh, tries to solve both the context problem and the cost problem. And the first hard part is how do you give people context when they only have a local view of the global data? And the trick here is that instead of giving a fixed subset of items to each worker, we let them 
randomly sample from the entire data set and stop when they've found four different categories. And this idea is inspired by decades of research in cognitive psychology um, started by Eleanor Roche on the basic level of categorization. So the idea is that if you get enough data, and you now have enough data as adults, you would walk out on the street and if you saw an animal, you would probably call it a dog, you probably wouldn't call it an animal, and you probably wouldn't call it like a labradoodle, like species, terrier hybrid, right? And so um, the idea is that you're able, by looking at enough data, to understand what the important cut points are in that data. And by giving people the ability to sample randomly from the data until they're confident, we're leveraging that cognitive capability. And so we, it, it does seem that people are doing this. Uh, a lot of them sampled, you know, most of them sampled about five to 15 times. Uh, some of them sampled even more than that to feel confident in uh, the, their clusters. And the second part that we have is we need some way to aggregate those. So we had a machine learning backbone that allowed us to break up the problem in a way that matched the strengths of humans and machines. So if you look at a lot of information, it tends to be distributed, norm, uh, sorry, distributed exponentially or according to a power law. So you get this big fat head, right? And there, it's not useful to have crowds label every single piece of information. If they can train, if you can use those seeds to train the machine, it can take over for those easy uh, ones where there's lots of data. And there's a nice property with random sampling that raters are more likely to actually sample those common categories. So this leaves a bunch of items over on the right in the tail. And there's only one or a few instances of these, and it's not useful or even viable to train a model on these, so we flip it, and we have crowds who are cleaning up and labeling those items that the model isn't confident in. And so if you put these two things together, we can look at how our system performs on data sets compared to other approaches. And uh, what we see is significant gains in precisions compared to baseline approaches. The y-axis here is something called NMI, which is basically wrapping precision and recall and controlling for the number of clusters all into one. Uh, basically, higher is better. And uh, here we can compare to other crowd clustering models as well. And what you see is that the better context helps us create better categories. And by working together with machines, we can at the same time save costs by not having to get labels for each piece of data. Okay, so this suggests that, and, and you know, I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done here. We, you know, there's plenty of uh, improvements to be made. But it does suggest that humans and machines working together can provide the best of both worlds. Okay, so now we have a decentralized way of creating clusters, of finding some structure in the data. So now let's get back to the problem of synthesizing that information. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna use Alloy as the keystone, the center point, in this process of synthesizing articles in a decentralized way. And so what we're specifically doing is we're taking the process that people go through as individuals, kind of making sense of stuff, like what I was doing with Japan, right? Looking at all these different articles, breaking them up into different pieces, figuring out which pieces are relevant, st stitching them together into common topics, and making those topics coherent with each other. And in our case, we're also adding things like images, multimedia, videos, um, to help people who are reading those. And we use this to generate articles to a variety, answering a variety of different questions from how do I unclog my bathtub drain, how do I get my tomato plants to produce more tomatoes, to things like my Chevy Silverado has this error code, what do I do, uh, or even what are the key arguments for and against global warming. And so just to give you a sense, this is what an output, one output might look like. Uh, what you see at the bottom are a bunch of references. These are sources that crowd workers found, sliced up, found the useful information from, stitched together into a coherent, uh, somewhat coherent topic uh, along the top. And you can see on the top left that there's a number of these topics uh, that exist for this particular question. 
Here's another question. This is a more technical question. Uh, this is a little bit more complex. So actually crowds didn't even understand a lot of the comments that were being made here, but they were still, because they had this understanding of grammar, understanding of argument structure, they were able to put it together in the right places and stitch those um, back together. So we compare the output of our system to a fairly conservative, a strong standard, which is the Tive Google results that came back for each question. Uh, people rated them blind to where each came from, which actually hurt us more because uh, we know that things like brand recognition, visual style, and layout, all things we are not good at, um, affect people's judgments of uh, trustworthiness and, and helpfulness and c confidence. Uh, but we wanted to see kind of how this approach would work and where, where it would work and wouldn't. And somewhat surprisingly, we actually found people significantly preferred our digests over the top five Google results in eight out of these 11 questions. And for the ones that weren't significant, it's not that Google did better, there was just no significant difference. And if you look at these, we, uh, the line, uh, the, the line across is, is our answer, so this is plotting uh, things above the line did better than us, things below the line we did better than. And you can see that there are a lot of things below the line that were in the top five Google results, that were in the top, that were the first Google result, that were things like the New York Times. Uh, and so some of the things we definitely didn't do as well as CDC is actually incredibly well trusted. Uh, and they put a lot of effort into their content, so I'm glad we did not do better than the CDC. But even things like travel, so you can see TripAdvisor and a number of travel sites, also there's a huge incentive for them to provide a lot of information there, and so uh, provide it in a well-structured way, uh, so we didn't do quite as well there either. But I think if you look at why we did so well compared to these, it wasn't because we were very well written, Right? It wasn't because of visual style or recognition or anything like that. I think it's because we brought together information from a lot of different sources. And so you could know with some confidence, not just one person says that, a lot of people say that. And I think this idea of, you know, think of it as like a meta-analysis, right? I think this is going to be really important, increasingly important, as the amount of information and opinions and advice and reviews all continue to grow. Now, one important thing I didn't talk about yet, you may have noticed, is cost, right? Our articles cost a fair amount of money. We cost $108 on average to generate from 160 tasks. We weren't trying to optimize for tasks. We were instead trying to see if we could do this in a decentralized way. So you can see no task paid more than a dollar. Uh, we're averaging federal minimum wage or higher. Uh, so there are a lot of things you could do if you wanted to reduce costs. You could uh, take out the editing tasks, they took about 40% of our budget. You can get away without them in a lot of cases, for a lot of use cases. Uh, and there's a lot of redundancy, so if we had smarter control flows, so like if you used PalmDPs or other machine learning techniques, we could probably um, cut a lot of that out. Still, $100 for an article that's considered as valuable or more valuable than top Google search results might be useful for a number of purposes. And in fact, we found one really interesting case around this automotive diagnosis. And so if you have an uh, error with your car, it turns out that it's pretty hard to figure out exactly what the cause is, because there can be a lot of different causes. But people are giving each other advice all the time on these forums about what could be the cause and how to fix it. And so all of this stuff is actually out there. It's just spread out, unstructured, and super messy. So we were looking at um, how do we do in these automotive diagnostics problems versus commercial services. So we looked at three uh, services. They all charged over a million dollars a year for subscriptions. Uh, and what we found is we could find all of the answers in them Plus, we find these cool long tail answers, like if your truck is parked in a barn, it might be because a mouse is burrowing into it for warmth, right? And so what I think this shows is that compared to traditional ways of building databases, so here, in fact, it's extremely costly because you have to call up technicians and ask them for every car, for every year, for every model, 
what is this error code's possible causes, we can see cost reductions of, you know, 100 to 1,000 X by combining crowds, machine learning, and these messy, unstructured, but valuable information from the web, right? And so we have an industry partner working on this, testing this out in the real world. But I think more generally, it suggests there's this incredible opportunity to take all of this information that's out there, tutorials and uh, reviews and forums and advice to other people, and make it much more valuable through structuring it. So we see that crowd work has a very different and complementary set of characteristics on peer production. On the one hand, we can decentralize this process, find structure from the data, and because it has monetary incentives, we can get people to work on it, even if they don't have an intrinsic motivation to work on automotive diagnostics, for example. But that also limits what we can work on, right? So we need to be able to commercially justify the cost that we're putting into it. So we have two approaches now. How do we get towards a more universal approach? Okay, something that we can scale up even bigger than this. So let, let's start by looking at how big Wikipedia is. So there's some estimates that Wikipedia took about 100 million hours to put together. If we look at web browsing, what people are doing is they naturally search the web. It's much more than that, right? It's 200 billion hours. If you look at uh, various studies, about a third of what is being spent on web browsing is actually time spent on these complex sense-making tasks, like figuring out health information, or purchasing a car, or doing market research, um, or figuring out where to live. And essentially, all of this is being thrown away, right? So just to put it in perspective, it's about two Wikipedias per day that's being spent on this and thrown away. So if we could capture just a tiny bit of that work and allow people to build on it, just imagine how quickly we could get to something um, that's really, really valuable. Now, there's a problem here, though, which you might be thinking of now, which is that people's goals, everybody's different, right? And people's goals might be very different from what your goals are or your needs. So for example, if you were planting, trying to figure out how to plant a garden in California, you might use very different plants than you would in Quebec City, right? Uh, and so in the extreme, maybe there's just too little payoff to make it worth using other people's cognitive work. So to investigate this, we did a series of experiments where we'd give people a task to research like starting a vegetable garden, and then we'd have them create a knowledge map from it, what they found useful during their search. And then we would bring someone else in and say, you know what, you can use this or not use this, you can choose what to do if this is useful to you, kind of use it, and you have to do the same exact task. Okay, and so you can see here, over various iterations, um, you, we would actually see a lot of interesting structure emerge as people would do this task and then redo this task over and over again. So we had an experiment in which we had four iterations, so four people would come and do the task starting with the previous person's knowledge map, or we had people doing uh, the map on their own. And we looked at, we had uh, people rate the quality of these maps, and what we found is that compared to the solo map, if someone had iterated on a map a number of times, if we had four people iterate on that map, we would see an increase in the quality of that map. But if only one person had iterated, it was actually worse. So now we have a problem, because starting from one person's map is actually worse than starting from scratch, right? But how do we get to the person who's four down, right? We're never going to get there. So we have this hump that we need to get through, and this is kind of a, a major problem here. So what, what's going on? Why, why is this happening? So we looked at why maps were considered helpful versus unhelpful. And interestingly, what people cited as most helpful was not the content of the maps, it was the organization that emerged as people started to iterate on those maps. 
Meanwhile, what was unhelpful was the content. So here's a representative quote. Although I deleted 50% of what was on the other knowledge map, it gave me some ideas right away on where to look and which factors or questions I should consider during my search. Or to bring this back to planting a garden, you might not use the same plants, but you should know about soil acidity or temperature zones, right? And those are the kinds of useful structure that would be good for you to know. So this raises the problem of this hump. How do we get people over the hump so that we can build up this critical momentum, right? And we've, and we're going to fast forward over kind of five years of exploration in which we've learned the hard way that the cost structure of searching is really challenging to improve. The basic problem is a cost-benefit one, right? So especially at the beginning of a search, people don't want anything, no matter how easy, to get in their way when they don't know exactly what they're looking for yet. Okay, because they don't see the benefit there, uh, because they don't, everything is still quite uncertain. So what this suggests is, can we instead design for this uncertainty that exists when people just start off making sense of an unfamiliar topic? So for example, at WIST last year, uh, we presented a system that aims to address the high cost of selecting text, so clipping kind of text on a, uh, on a mobile phone. And so this is hard because you have, to, you, know, it's, you have to specify those positions at the beginning and the end and kind of where things should go. So instead, our system does two things. First of all, it allows you to use force touch to kind of choose how much you want to highlight and move it around very easily. And the other thing is we experimented with making the boundary fuzzy as opposed to making it a hard boundary. And the interesting thing is the, that people like the force touch, they definitely like the force touch, but the most useful thing they found was actually making it a fuzzy boundary. And the reason is that reduce the cognitive costs of deciding exactly when to start when you aren't able to predict very precisely the future need for this content, right? So we're sort of deferring that decision until later. And I think designing for cognitive costs like this, instead of just physical costs, is a potentially a useful paradigm that can open up a lot of design spaces for interaction. So here's another example. Uh, we see similar costs which come up from the way people use tabs. So because people aren't sure what information they're going to need in the future, they tend to keep tabs open when they're looking, you know, when you start uh, this process. Remember when I looked at Japan, I started opening up a whole bunch of tabs. Now you can see actually these were, this is a snapshot of my tabs from last week. Well, actually this is a snapshot of my tabs from last week. Uh, and they are still growing, right? And you know, things get kind of bad. Uh, things actually get particularly bad on mobile devices where there's problems with screen real estate, frequent interruptions, and kind of constant multitasking. And in fact, last year was the first year that mobile searches overtook desktop searches, and there's an increasing population of mobile-only browsers uh, across the globe. So to address this, we've been doing studies on how, what are the cognitive functions and costs that people use tabs for. And at a high level, we found they use them for two different things, for task management, for keeping your tasks separated from each other, for switching and re res resuming between them, for reminding you of those tasks. And we also use them as sort of a workspace, right? So we prioritize things, we open and close them, we keep track of how far you've scrolled down in the tab. Uh, you don't know how useful it is, so let me just keep it open in case it's useful later. And tabs serve both of these functions right now, but they don't serve them, either of them, particularly well. So we designed a browser called Bento uh, for the mobile phone, which separates those functions to help people do complex searches on these mobile devices. So basically, instead of the long list of tabs that you see on the left, we organize search into tasks, which are sort of the first order unit of navigation. These tasks are actually how you browse. They drive how you browse and navigate, and you can use them in, you, to keep all of the searches and all of the pages that you look at together within these tasks. Now, the second part of it, uh, second to the right, is that we turn your 
search results page into a mutable workspace. So here we have the functions for starring, marking things as to read. You can trash search results. We can keep track of how far you've read on each of these. So these are all these functions of workspace tabs that we're putting into the search results page. Uh, and so in other words, we're supporting a lot of these functions that tabs provide, but we're refactoring them in a way that supports complex thinking on mobile devices. So uh, I thought I'd actually show you, it's taken a, a little bit of a, you know, some refinement, so I thought I'd show you how it's used today. Actually, this is how it was used this weekend uh, when I was in Toronto. And you can see as I go into my Toronto task, uh, it's organized by all the searches I made about Toronto, for example, uh, finding the best dim sum, and I can queue up or trash things for me to read. And I can also, as I go through these pages, I can take notes, and you can see the notes that I've clipped from all of the pages I've read, organized by the subtask I was working on. So it's kind of providing a structure or a scaffold for you to keep progressing on your tasks. Okay, and the big idea is that if we can help people with this initial phase of making sense of stuff for themselves, now we can capture this rich model that they're building up in their heads and make it useful for others coming after them. So this is our latest shot at building a foundation for this global universal knowledge accelerator. So check us out. Um, you can download our mobile browser if you sign up at IOTA browser.com. If you choose U WIST or HCOMP, we'll actually, uh, my students are, will bump you up to the top of the list. We'll try to get you access like in the next hour. Uh, and please give us honest, the only thing we ask is for honest feedback about um, what you think and how, how could something like this work or be made better to support um, this idea of a knowledge accelerator in the future. Okay, so what we've seen today are three different ways of creating a universal knowledge accelerator, and they all have their own strengths and weaknesses, right? So peer production is powerful if you have volunteers with intrinsic motivation, if you have leaders to structure their work. Crowd work can give you an on-demand, scalable workforce. It's decentralized, if you can afford it. And I think we're just beginning to unlock the power of people searching for information for themselves. And especially in this last column, there's a lot more that we need to do here. And I actually think that WIST and HCOM are perfectly positioned to do this. So let's just walk through what are some examples. So you know, Im imagine if we could improve people's motivation by actually helping them collect and structure their information. Right? So some of the possibilities here would be eye tracking, physiological sensing interfaces to tell people what, what are people interested in without them having to explicitly uh, cost effort to tell you. We could use gesture, pen, haptic inf interfaces to capture and structure that information in different ways. We could help people see that structure better with AR or VR or on mobile devices. Or consider content. Right? While we would like things to be universal, the reality is we might need to treat different types of content differently. And that actually gives rise to interesting opportunities too, right? So for example, with 3D printing, uh, so this is actually something printed from Thingiverse. You can download and print those on your 3D printer today. You can have people literally building on the work of others, right? So you can take that and riff on it and build something else that does uh, whatever you need it to do. And imagine what we could do when we have these rich structures like CAD models or software code along with that web-based content, right? We now have this other area that we can propagate that content into and that you can go along and transfer along with you, right? So this is a whole new area that would be uh, potentially really beneficial to the people who are end users building this stuff and um, a way for them, for us to understand how they build on each other. And finally, aggregation is still a wide open issue, right? When you have all of these different people, how do you combine the efforts of millions of them making sense of stuff for themselves? And here I would say two big open problems are personalization, so how do you tell who's going to benefit from what, uh, as well as how do you pull rich structure out of these complex behavioral traces. And I think we have some inklings of ways that we're doing that today. 
uh, but there need to be kind of new models that will support this in the future. And let me end by saying that solving these problems is becoming really important really fast. So whether it's because of fake news, whether you're helping people be intelligent citizens so they know what policies to support, what people to vote for, whether you're accelerating innovation and trying to help with scientific discovery in the face of increasing complexity out there, or whether you're helping workers who are becoming displaced by AI and robotics, and they're going to need to learn new skills and knowledge, and they're going to keep needing to learn new skills and knowledge as computation takes over the routine parts of work. For all of these things, we're going to need better engines for thinking. And if we can build on the work that every single one of you is doing here, I think we could have a chance to make it happen. Thank you.